Okay, so the purpose of this talk, my goal here today, really is to explain as best I can what is AKI, what is acute kidney injury, and what the definition is, etiology, and some of those causes. So some foundational information, AKI is very common in the critically ill population. It is essential for early detection. And I mentioned that, I think, during our little brief uh, dialogue there, that it usually isn't really detected early, um, but in particular by healthcare providers that are not nephrologists or have specialized nephrology training. Because the earlier you can recognize the problem, the better off you are at potentially reducing the long-term ill effects of the uh, of the disease. Oh, I'm too far. There have been a multitude of studies. <clears throat> I've just listed a few here. The best kidney uh, out of JAMA, 4.5% of all critically ill patients develop AKI with a mortality exceeding 60%. Uh, in o with O'Neill and critical care, he said that 2.5, 2 to 5 percent, I'm sorry, of cardiac surgery patients develop AKI with a 50 percent mortality and uh, significant long term consequences. Now, uh, that seems pretty low because I've, yeah. I've seen much higher than that in terms and STS, I think has it between five and 7%, but if it's an isolated valve, I think it's between 10 and 15%, it's much higher. So now we're looking at another study out of the uh, Annals of Cardiac Anesthesia in 2016, that uh, cardiac surgery associated AKI has a 20% of those patients will develop it, and it's associated with an 8% 90-day mortality. Again, very significant uh, mortality problem. So in regards to the pathophysiology of the disease, Dr. Uh, uh, Ronaldo Bolomo, I think he's out of Australia, and uh, Claudio Ronco out of Italy, both of them are brilliant uh, nephrologists and intensive care medicine doctors. Um, and it's very interesting. Most intensive care medicine doctors you'll find are double boarded, mm -hmm. but usually in pulmonary care. There are some that are uh, nephrologists and uh, intensivists, but they're, uh, they're rare. But the Bolo Dr. Bolomo and Dr. Ronco are two of those rarities, I guess, if you will. They recognized in the article that they wrote that this is a significant problem. That is cardiac surgery associated AKI. It is very complex and multifactorial. It has at least six major uh, injury pathways, both exogenous and endogenous toxins, metabolic derangements, ischemia and reperfusion injury, neurohormonal activation, and inflammation and oxidative stress. They also uh, stated that it was very important to avoid nephrotoxic drugs while on pump, and that includes furosemide. So Lasix is a nephrotoxic mm -hmm. drug. The, 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 the kidney does not like it, mm -hmm. but yet we use it liberally uh, as, uh, as if we're giving a, uh, an 81 milligram aspirin. I think it's a problem. But what don't you see? And what you don't see is nowhere in there do you see ultrafiltration as a potential cause for cardiac surgery associated uh, acute kidney injury. So definition, acute kidney injury was first described in 1918 by a Dr. William McNiter, and it had to do with a uh, patient who had a, uh, a diagnosis of mercury poisoning. But in two, it later became ARF, acute renal failure. And in 2004, ARF was really redefined to be AKI. And the rifle criteria became sort of popular as a mechanism by which we assess a patient's renal function and determine whether there is AKI. Rifle has three severity grades uh, and two outcome classes. And here's a uh, diagram of it. So you see on the left GFR criteria, you see on the right urine output criteria, and you have risk, injury, failure, loss, and end-stage kidney disease. So RIFLE stands for that, risk, injury, failure, loss, and end-stage uh, kidney failure, kidney disease. 
Um, so you can have an increased creatinine of 1.5 or a GFR decrease of 1.5 uh, percent, that is, uh, and a 25 uh, percent uh, uh, decrease in your GFR. So if your creatinine is, uh, and it's 1.5 times, excuse me. So you start off with a creatinine of one and uh, after the surgery you're at 1.5, well, you're in the risk category. Or if your urine output is less than five mLs per hour per kilogram for six hours. Injury, absolute injury would be essentially a doubling of your serum creatinine with a decrease of your of 50% of your GFR or a urine output of less than 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour for 12 hours. Failure increased times three of your uh, serum creatinine GFR decreased 70 by 75% or an absolute serum, serum creatinine level of four milligrams per deciliter, or any acute rise of equal to or greater than 0 0.5 milligrams per deciliter, or you can see the urine output over there in particular and urea. So it's pretty obvious you've, you've got a serious problem there. The problem that you have with creatinine is that it's a very delayed response. Creatinine takes a while before it actually shows up. So when you see it at 1.5 times your baseline, by the time you see that and you think this patient is at risk, but it is going to get worse, it probably already is much worse. And I think that results in under treatment quite frequently. And then you have the uh, two outcomes, which is persistent acute renal failure and loss, complete loss of kidney function for greater than four weeks. And then, of course, uh, ESRD or ESKD, end stage renal disease. So greater than three months, you are on, you're on dialysis. So rifle on the left then became Aiken. And you have uh, all of these different classifications. So they're trying to find a way, something that may have been better than rifle. And Aiken stands for the Acute Kidney Injury Network. And uh, they came up with, instead of this uh, uh, risk and uh, outcome classification, they came up with stages, stage one, two, and three. And you can read what they are there. It's very important to note in the Aiken criteria that once you receive any form of renal replacement therapy, whether that be intermittent hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy, CVVH or whatever you want to call it, you automatically are considered to be stage three. And then came Cadigo or Cadigo, however you like to say it. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but that is the uh, uh, kidney disease improving global outcomes and their criteria really is very similar to the Aiken with very, very little difference. There's a few minor things, but uh, I don't really think enough to uh, spend a whole lot of time on it. I think it's important, however, to be familiar with these three things and to have some understanding of them so that when you're looking at a patient's labs, you can, or, or their INOs or your not put in the ICU on an ECMO patient, you can actually take a look at it and see that there may be a problem and notify somebody, hey, I think we're trending in the wrong direction. Certainly worth understanding them. So in the etiology of AKI, it can be pre-renal, it can be post-renal, it can be intrinsic disease. And there are numerous potential causes of AKI, mainly related to a focal mismatch. So this is a takeaway point. You want to remember this. A focal mismatch between oxygen and nutrient delivery and increased energy demands resulting in cellular stress. So you have to deliver the right amount of oxygen and the right nutrients to the kidney, or you will impair microcirculation certainly as part of it. And that increased energy demand and that mismatch will result in additional cellular stress. Intrinsic disease, you can have a acute tubular uh, 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 necrosis, you can have glomerular nephritis, you can have uh, uh, interstitial nephritis, but the tubules of glomerulus, the interstitium, and the intrarenal blood vessels themselves can be affected directly. Now, I will say you can have intrinsic disease 
unrelated to uh, external f- forces vis-a-vis either pre-renal or post-renal. But I will tell you that when you have a problem that is pre-renal or post-renal that you do not address, it will ultimately become intrinsic disease. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's important also to understand. Post-renal, basically a a, a kidney stone, uh, anything blocking the renal tubule or urethra, uh, it results in an increase in renal tubule pressure and therefore a decrease in GFR. Pre-renal is the one that I really want to focus on, and it is related to hypoperfusion, decreasing GFR without damage to the renal parenchyma. So when you have a hypoperfusion state for a brief period of time, you your kidneys will actually reduce the glomerular filtration rate, and there, which is an adaptive response, which therefore reduces their energy demand. So you on pump and you're in a low flow state, your GFR is going to drop precipitously, but in an adaptive sense, then Mm -hmm. you're going to come back up. Mm -hmm. So short time hypoperfusion in and of itself is not going to cause a long-term problem. Again, depending on how long you are in that hyperperfusion state. You had mentioned in your previous lecture uh, a couple a month ago or so, I guess it's, re- it's been, that the O2 consumption of the kidney does not change with temperature. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to understand that even though you may be somewhat hypothermic, you're really not you can't depend on that to protect the kidneys and say, I can go longer in this hypotensive state. You can do that with the brain mm-hmm. or hypoperfused state. You can do that with the brain. You can do that with a lot of other organs. You can do it with the gut, but you can't do that with the kidneys. It's kind of an interesting thing. So causes re- of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pre-renal uh, uh, AKI are renal ischemia, reperfusion inflammation, Hemolysis, of course, that's obstructive, oxidative stress, embolic events, and toxins, including diuretics, which are nephrotoxic. And this chart, I think, really describes a lot of interesting things. You've got preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative causes, risks and causes of uh, cardiac surgery, AKI. Uh, Advanced age in the Preoperative uh, uh, column, female gender, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, chronic kidney disease. So if you've already pre- you're already predisposed, liver disease, peripheral vascular disease, previous stroke, smoking history, diabetes, and anemia. So and of course th- that's kind of tugs at my heartstrings because when we go on pump and hemodilute the patient and we are much more anemic than usual, it is its own, it is an independent risk factor of AKI. Intraoperative, more complex the surgery, CPB duration or time, need to return to CPB more than likely because you had a shock state prior to actually doing that or additional hemodilution perhaps. Low hematocrit during CPB, though they don't really identify what low means. And I know that's very, uh, that's, a, that's a, another debate that seems to always rage. Aortic cross clamp time hypoperfusion, hypovolemia, venous congestion, emboli, cholesterol, and other, uh, inotrope exposure, and in the postoperative phase, vasopressors. I know you said Neo was horrible for the, mm-hmm. uh, for the kidneys and renal circulation. Inotropes, diuretic exposure, blood transfusions, anemia, hypovolemia, venous congestion, cardiogenic shock. So all of these things are factors that cause uh, 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 cardiac surgery associated AKI. This is a very interesting graph. And this graph I really liked, and I wanted to share it with you all out of the uh, Journal of CV Surgery. If, uh, If you look at the lines, the green line is basically a normal GFR greater than 60. The red line is a somewhat compromised GFR between 30 and 60. 
And the blue line is a low GFR, compromised kidney function, with a GFR less than 30. So if you look at the green line, your cardiopulmonary bypass time almost doesn't affect your risk of developing AKI, that thing of being on bypass that long, until you get out to a little bit past two hours. Then you see a little bump. Now, if you have somewhat compromised GFR or kidney function, you can see that right at about 120 minutes, it really starts to make a change. And at 180 minutes, it's making a more significant change. By the time you get out to uh, three hours uh, or four hours, you're really uh, at a higher risk. But look at the blue line. If you're starting off with a GFR of less than 30, and you go on pump for almost any length of time, there's a very high likelihood you are not going to come out of there with your kidneys. This interesting schematic shows how the pump and the oxygen, the, the heart-lung machine interacts with the kidneys in a negative way. You have hemolysis generation, plasma-free hemoglobin, Re results in a uh, an oxygen radical, free oxygen radical formation and lipid peroxidation that affects the kidneys directly. You have central nervous system stimulation, results in increased catecholamines with vasoconstriction, which results in ischemia and again, hypoperfusion of the kidneys, hypoperfusion in general, ischemia, same thing, atheroembolic events, same thing, inflammation and leukocyte recruitment and infiltration into the, uh, into the endothelial uh, lining of the kidneys, again, all resulting in AKI and injury. Now, this article that uh, recently has been published, albeit is about red cell transfusion and cardiopulmonary bypass, there seems to be, and I, I don't quite understand it, but there seems to be a push to, uh, and in this article, they infer that AKI may be uh, associated with ultrafiltration on bypass. And that's why I asked you to give that talk tomorrow. I didn't share this with you. I, sh I asked you to give that talk tomorrow uh, about that topic. So I'm really interested to see what you came up with independently and uh, how we can address this. So I wanted to just touch on this for a second because I don't really understand this concept that, that ultrafiltration uh, causes acute kidney injury irrespective of what the urine output is on bypass. But I wanted to show you this article because I think this article is extremely important and is from the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2015. And, you you know, we talked earlier today, you mentioned to me that, you know, we do, ev human beings have evolved, right? You know, mammals evolve, everything evolves, right? Um, and insects even evolve, evolve, but they don't evolve in four years. So the physiology that we had four years ago is the same physiology that we have today, right? Agreed? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so just very quickly, and you can go back to that uh, slide, put that slide back up. But in this particular study, they did a bundle of interventions, mainly at limiting the renal impact of hemodilution during CPB and stated that it is effective by limiting the hemodilutional impact of CPB is effective in reducing the acute kidney injury uh, rate. And so what they're saying, so that I sort of explain this very clearly, they're saying that the greater your hemodilution, the more uh, likely you are as an independent marker of acute kidney injury. That could be due to anemia. We can go to the full screen if you want. We could bring Keith in too. We can go, that could be due to anemia and just not delivering enough oxygen. There's that mismatch of nutrient need and, 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 and requirement. We can have, it can be a result of uh, non-continuous flow. It can be a result of a lot of things. But if you ultra filtrate, and we'll talk more about it, I know tomorrow, and I don't mean to try to jump on top of the topic, but if you are trying to raise your, your DO2, you have a certain flow and you're trying to re raise the amount of oxygen you're able to deliver to tissue by removing plasma water and having a higher hematocrit, 
notwithstanding all the other issues that we can talk about again tomorrow as well. I hope you all join us tomorrow, which would be the, the third spacing of volume and all of those kinds of things. Um, I think this paper is really very telling in that limiting uh, hemo dilution during CPB is very effective at reducing AKI rates. And I think that ultrafiltration on CPB is critically important. And frankly, and this may seem a little provocative, I'm not trying to, to I don't want to be, I'm not going to personally criticize anyone, but I do believe it is irresponsible of anyone to suggest that ultrafiltration uh, to manage uh, excess fluid volume and reduce anemia, which we know is harmful on cardiopulmonary bypass to say that in some way that actually hurts the kidneys. I think it's irresponsible and I think that we need to address it um, from, a, uh, from a professional uh, evidence-based uh, perspective. Your thoughts? Well, as a traveler and someone who, uh, when I go into a place and I, I, I love to ask questions about, um, uh, you know, I need to know how you how you do your perfusion so I can mimic that. And sometimes I say, um, okay, so you do this or you don't do that. And, you know, what's the reason for that so I know. And I hear this uh, really at an alarming rate. <clears throat> well, we don't use the hemoconcentrator. I remember the first time I heard this about five years ago. We had a, I was watching the case the first day I was there. And perfusion had a lot of volume in the, in the reservoir. And I said, well, and the crit was pretty low. And I said, well, um, you want me to grab a hemoconcentrator out of the cabinet? Oh no, uh, we we had a, this this surgeon. Uh, uh, we had a case that we used hemoconcentrator, and this, the, the the patient had AKI, and this surgeon thinks that it was due to the hemoconcentrator. And I thought to myself, this surgeon thinks that it was due to the hemoconcentrator. That's that's what you're basing this on. But since that time, about five years ago, I've heard this similar type of uh, scenario where people are real hesitant. Some have even abandoned it altogether to use the hemoconcentrator. And I keep hearing it's almost a foregone conclusion in some people's mind that it's mm. causing AKI. Mm. And somehow I have yet to see a single article or a single evidence that that's the case. And in 50 years of perfusion, we've researched this and all of the indications are quite the opposite. I feel like we're going uh, backwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'd be open to anyone <clears throat> to, to learn anything new, but I cannot... I get my head around where this comes from. And every time I ask someone, in fact, I had this conversation the other day. I said uh, to someone who'd been out of school about four or five years, you know, and they said, well, you have to, you have to be very careful about using a concentrator. You know, it, it could cause AKI. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, um, I can't seem to find anything on that. So they got on their phone and they couldn't find anything either. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find a single article. Mm -hmm. I've yet to be able to find it. It's interesting. Keith, you got any thoughts? Well, uh, it is interesting. Uh, I was at the AMSAC conference down in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, there was a couple of, uh, well, I don't, know, I don't know what to say other than I think they're bad actors. Um, we're up there trying to promote this whole AKI uh, ultrafiltration, um, one led to the other kind of thing. And they even brought in a anesthesiologist from Duke. And I talked to the Duke people and they said, the last time I did a case with that gentleman, I had 1,600 in my reservoir with a crit of 21, and I wanted to hemoconcentrate, and he said, add a unit of blood. And that kind of mentality, just, I don't understand it at all. I mean, that is just so far gone. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it, it is. It's, 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 I, it makes no sense to me either. So I know we have one more talk, and I think we have a, dis we have a discussion period after John's last talk. Keith, is there any way we can ask you to, to hang around and be a part of that discussion? Because once John finishes his talk, it, we can have a free-for-all, I think, in here and have a lot of fun.